Uh, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Warui. It's such a joy to come back to this uh, forum uh, to continue discussing uh, issues of communication. I'm very happy to see uh, some of you and uh, we'll start off and as others join us, we will um, continue. So we'll do a quick uh, um, refresh, refresh, refresher, yeah? refresher. <laughs> I was about to say refresher. Uh, and uh, we j just to have a look at what we said, we started by saying that uh, um, communication comes from, um, okay, well, the slide there is that communication is a process through which a message transmitted through an appropriate media is understood by the audience as the sender intended. Um, let's keep going uh, to the next slide. Um, and we say it actually comes from two words, uh, communis, communis, which is Latin. And we say that really what you want to do in communication is to increase the uh, amount of commonality between you and the other person. So person A and person B are independent. Uh, if you are saying that they are uh, communicating with one another, then they are increasing understanding. The space between the two should continue to grow. Uh, the next slide um, is a quick summary um, of what uh, communication is. Uh, let's go to the next because this will come back later. Um, and then we talked about competence. Uh, and, and this whole thing is about competence, to be competent in something. And we see that this refers to uh, the knowledge of effective and appropriate, the word effective and the word appropriate are important, uh, communication patterns and the ability to use and adapt that knowledge in various contexts. And as Pastor has said, those contexts va va vary all the way from uh, family, uh, to church, to business, um, to ministry, uh, actually life itself. Uh, isn't really life when there is no communication. So it's the ability to communicate personally, effectively, and in a socially appropriate manner. Again, the word appropriate is important because what is appropriate in this setting may not be appropriate in another setting. So you may be a very effective communicator uh, in, in one setting and, and become a, a, a terrible communicator in another setting. Um, let's go on. So the, the, the capacity to choose, the, the capacity to choose what symbols to use when, that is competence. And it's very important that you ask yourself, am I competent in this area? Uh, we talked about four hurdles uh, of communication. We said you need, first of all, um, if you want to communicate with me or with someone, you must draw their attention. What will make someone listen to you uh, and not the other person? Uh, at, at, uh, if you come to church settings, for instance, um, those of us who are pastors know that uh, the person uh, at home has now a myriad of, uh, um, of stations to tune in. So they have a, a remote control gadget on their hands. So they check out on, your, on their church and they find, so they get a little bored. They, they click, they, the next church is just a click away. Uh, and the church does not have to be in Kenya. It can be in the US, so it can be somewhere in, in uh, some other place. So attention is very important. But you need to grow, to go beyond attention uh, to get acceptance. So I have listened to you, yes, the first five minutes, I have made a decision, do I make sense of what you are saying? I have begun to accept you. Then if I accept you, then I listen to the whole of what you are saying, I, you need to ensure that you have given me enough information so that I can interpret what you are saying correctly. Because it's also possible to misinterpret what you are saying, uh, and then I, I don't get the point completely. And then eventually, what do I do with that information? That is called disposition. So these four steps are important for any uh, communicator. Uh, the next slide is now a summary of, uh, uh, a summary of what we discussed. We talked about components of communication. We say that in every communication activity, there will be a communicator. That communicator uh, who has is the sender. You can also say is sending. Uh, that communicator is sending a message, and the message is a content uh, of, of what is being said. That is done through a medium or a channel. 
And then where is all that information going? To an audience or a receptor, the person who receives. So actually communication is between this communicator and this audience, but this whole process is important. But between the communicator and the audience, there is some level that, uh, something that says, I hear you, I see you, and that is feedback. And many times these roles are switched within a communication activity. If you are the one talking and I'm listening, I am the recipient or the audience and you are the communicator or the sender. When I respond to you, now we change and you become uh, the other way, we go the other way around. So these processes are important uh, and we already talked about them. So I'm just running through to refresh those uh, uh, who may have forgotten. So today we want to spend time talking about nonverbal uh, communication. And even before uh, we, we go there, I'll just echo uh, what uh, uh, has been said before, that communication is really the glue. It's the glue that, and the oil. So you can say uh, the glue that brings people together or the oil that lub lubricates uh, a communication activity. Without proper communication in an organization, in a family, uh, in a company, in a business, things will not go very well. And I see my friend, Dr. Uh, Mwangangi uh, has tuned in. So Dr. Mwangi, somewhere in the course of our talk, I'll ask you to give a little bit of your own um, experience as a marketer. Uh, Dr. Mwangangi was a marketer for uh, many years, uh, marketing uh, uh, medicine. So at some point, uh, I will ask him to uh, say one or two things about he, the impact of communication uh, in a business setting. I hope that uh, Mwangagi has heard me. <laughs> All right, so um, since communication is uh, most effective when it elicits uh, all our senses, nonverbal communication is very helpful in enhancing understanding. Now, I didn't define nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication happens when you are using other symbols of communication other than uh, words, other than, uh, than, than talking. There are other methods of communication that enhance that whole experience uh, of communication. And there are 12 signals that uh, uh, communicators have, have identified as, as things that enhance a communication activity. Let's go to those uh, 12 signals. Uh, but even before we go to the 12 signals, um, it is very interesting, uh, this is just an illustration, as a leader, uh, you can ask yourself, how much time is spent communicating in an organization, in an organization? Um, leaders spend about 80% of their work days communicating. If you're a manager uh, in an organization, you might actually find that 80% of your time is spent in every day communicating. Now, how does that happen? These percentages don't add to 100. Uh, so the method of research is, is, is different. It's not like 100%. So, but this is just to illustrate uh, that 28% um, of, uh, of a leader, uh, of the time of a leader, uh, and you can think about yourself. There is a likelihood that you will be on emails you are communicating on emails. And some of us are pretty fast there uh, because your work may just involve a lot of uh, exchanging ideas. 26% of your time might actually be on phone, particularly if you're, you're chief executive, you're managing say 100 people. There is a likelihood you're going to spend a lot of time uh, on phone. Meetings, senior managers will spend probably half of their time uh, just sitting and talking uh, to, to in meetings, making decisions, making policies. Um, so you can see um, how much time can be spent in, in communication uh, wherever uh, you are. Uh, so you almost might wonder, so when does a manager do the rest of the work? What time does he get to do the rest of the work? 
Um, and you haven't even talked about uh, the impromptu conversations with coworkers on the corridors and employees and, uh, uh, and maybe you're making presentations in a company uh, or you have an external speaking engagement uh, and you are a leader and you're juggling all this. That is just how important communication uh, is. The next slide now brings us to our core uh, dis discussion uh, today. Um, and this is about um, nonverbal uh, communication. There are 12, you can actually call them 12 signal systems uh, in communication, 12 signal systems. I'll run through them, then I'll come to discuss them. This is all we are doing tonight, and then we'll have uh, time for, uh, for questions. So, verbal. Verbal is speech. Uh, so you are, you are reading. I have added uh, this, uh, although it is, part, it, is, it is, you could say it's, 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 uh, non, it's not non-verbal, uh, but I've added, put it there uh, just to make a point. Speech is, you know, you are speaking. Then written communication. Numeric communication, those are numbers. Pictorial, using pictures. Artifactual, these are objects, uh, three-dimensional representation as opposed to the pictorial, which is uh, two-dimensional. Audio, uh, just sound uh, and, and silence is also part of that. Kinesic uh, is body motions, facial expressions, movements of the hands and so on. Optical is light, amount of light. Tactile is a sense of touch and feeling. Special is issues of space and temporal is time and olfactory is taste and smell. Now, we'll look at uh, each of these right just from this slide. We'll take uh, a little bit of time here uh, before uh, we wrap up. And as we discuss these 12 signals, I'd like you to think about how you, you, you can apply communication in your scenario. Maybe as a parent and you're talking to children or as a spouse. Maybe as a chief executive in an organization, small or big, maybe a hundred people, maybe two people, maybe 10 people. Think about uh, a church, if you are a church person. Think about any other thing you do and how these things play uh, in uh, your work. So beginning with the uh, verbal. Verbal communication has to do with speeches. And uh, so people write speeches. Um, the president will, will read a speech, um, and in, 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 in that uh, uh, speech, uh, depending on how that speech is written, um, people will, you can overcome this, the, the four hurdles we talked about or lose the, or lose the fight. The first five, actually I would say three to five minutes of any speech. The listener is making up their minds about whether you have anything to say or not. Whether they will leave you, go do something else, or whether they will be glued there, listening to you because of how you have crafted uh, your uh, speech. So it's extremely important that if you are communicating um, through speech, that you do your, uh, your writing extremely well so that it catches attention, you must catch attention, at the beginning, and this could is the same as a sermon also, a sermon is a speech, it must catch attention. So how are you going to begin your speech? You will, maybe you start by greeting the people. You will have a hook. Now, those of you who write, uh, and, and writing is something we'll also be saying, um, you, you remember that you need to have something that catches people's attention, grab them by the throat, and you don't release them until you are done. So speech writing is an extremely important, whether it is something small, you've been told to speak in a mashakaya or in a wedding uh, or in some other place. Think through what you are going to say. Write it down well. And the next signal is actually uh, written symbols. Make sure it catches attention. It builds tension. Uh, those of you who remember novels, like uh, African uh, writers' novels, you, uh, you know that some novels, whether it's Gobi Wationgo or Wallace Oyinka or some other person, they are written in such a way that you don't keep it down very easily. A successful writer uh, or speech reader 
has written their speech in such a way that it catches you, hooks you. And there are a few very good uh, uh, speech givers. Uh, President Obama, for instance, great speech giver. And sometimes he doesn't have anything he's reading. Of course, uh, it, that's also a little deceptive because there are auto cues that, that, that he has if he is speaking in a hall. Uh, some several screens. If he turns this side, there's a screen. If he turns the front, there's a screen. This side, there's a screen. But here in Kenya, uh, where there was no screen when he came, he is still very uh, riveting uh, sp speaker. So there's a whole discussion we can have there uh, on speech and someone giving and so on. Uh, but that is one symbol of communication. Written communication. These are um, we've, we've, uh, we've talked about uh, speech up there, uh, the, but there we were talking about uh, how it's given. Now we are talking about how it is written. You will communicate, if you are in an organization and you are in a public relations uh, scenario, um, you are probably going to do pamphlets. You'll do flyers. Even this meeting has been advertised uh, using a, uh, a flyer. The message needs to be clear well written, not complicated. It, complicated. it needs to be simple and memorable and something you, know, you don't think too much about. Make it simple uh, and communicate, uh, communicate that. Now, if you're using a, a written communication, like, like you're giving a talk uh, using a PowerPoint and you're using a screen, one of the things you have to ask about is also about visibility. You cannot do anything less than 18 points uh, for visibility uh, if you are uh, giving uh, a speech or you are showing something using written communication. But also there are letters, you know, people write uh, uh, letters. Now, by the way, I don't know whether people write uh, letters these days. When we were growing up, uh, letters were very important. Uh, I am sure we all are grown up uh, here. I mean, there might be one or two, uh, but uh, just an example is uh, when people are uh, in, in high school, I still remember one girl uh, who wrote a letter, put a biscuit inside the letter, uh, folded it, and then uh, wrote uh, something like, fly me uh, to that particular school. Uh, even put perfume inside there. Uh, and so on. All those uh, very funny things that uh, young people used to do. Now I think they text more than, uh, than they write. But letters were treasured. You kept it uh, under your pillow. You read it many times. Um, and you wanted to try to interpret what did this person mean here? They said, uh, they said dear, dear Peterson or dear John, or they said dearest. Then you are trying to interpret dear. Dear, dear rest. That means I am the, the best of the dears, you know, and, and you're trying to interpret and so on. So written communication, extremely important. Numeric has to do with numbers. Numbers. Numbers, uh, in the Bible, um, numbers have meanings. Uh, seven, uh, for instance, is number of completion. Um, there, there are very many things you can, you can do and you can say about uh, numbers. Even a flashing, flashing of uh, a V salute like this has certain interpretation. And by the way, I need to say that these 12 signals have a lot of cultural interpretation. Cultural interpretation. So if I do that, uh, which means two in Kenya, uh, uh, which basically grew out of multipartism. So two, uh, elsewhere, that might mean something very different. Uh, so uh, numbers, and that will be mentioned also uh, elsewhere. Um, so numbers, extremely important. Pictorial. Pictorial is expressing uh, a message using pictures. The world of cartoons uh, was, uh, was very, cartoons were very effective. Illustrations using cartoons uh, that make people laugh. You make fun of, uh, uh, of, of what uh, uh, you are describing. So if you, what you are trying to do when you're using these signals is to touch all senses, the five senses, because learning takes place better when more senses are elicited. 
sense of feeling, sense of sight, sense of smell, sense of, of touch, uh, and all that. So if you use a picture, uh, if, you, if you use a picture, even on a page, say it's a magazine page, when there are no pictures, we say it is a gray, uh, a gray page. When you add a picture, a little bit of space, some white space here and there, you are adding more visibility, some more beauty. So pictures uh, are very important. Someone has also said that even in speech, if you can draw a picture using your words, I'm likely to understand you much better. If you describe uh, something like how the walls of Jericho fell down with a mighty third, you have, you have drawn a picture there. And I can, I can hear it, I can feel it, I can see it. Pictures are very important. They stick uh, in one's mind. Artifactual, this has to do with things. It's three-dimensional compared to a picture uh, because you're dealing with objects. Um, for instance, I can see that Pastor Aroy is using uh, uh, earphones. Those are objects uh, that he, he is using. Uh, those are artifacts. Um, if I, the way I am dressed, that's an artifact and it communicates. Uh, so uh, the things I hold, the books I hold, the pen, I hold, if I start playing around with a pen and I'm still speaking to you, I am drawing attention. Uh, you, so your attention moves away from me and it's going to this artifact. If it's golden, you are now checking. Uh, if I want you to, to know uh, how I am I'm, I'm dressed, then I will come and I might want you to see my watch. So I'll be playing around here. Uh, I'm trying to show you my artifacts. Uh, and so on. The handbag you carry is an artifact. It communicates the, the, head, the head dress you have if you are a lady, that's a, um, a, an artifact. Those things are part of communication. They make or and make you, they give a picture of who you are and they build or destroy your credibility as a communicator. The way you are dressed, depending on the the audience you're, 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 you're going to talk to. If I'm going to talk to young people, um, even a t-shirt would be fine. The type of shoes I wear and so on, that might be fine. But I cannot do that on a Sunday morning uh, in an adult service. They will think I don't respect them. So those artifacts, the artifacts around you um, make a lot of sense uh, in your communication. Audio. Audio is sounds, uh, sounds and silence. I can be high, I can say praise the Lord, and I can say praise the Lord, and I can say hallelujah, and I can say amen, oh glory to God. Now, the, whatever I elicit in you is determined on my volume, on my pitch, am I high, am I low? When I speak and say glory to God, and then I pause, that is called a pregnant pause. That pregnant pause allows you to reflect on what I have just said. For instance, I realize that I'm speaking pretty fast today. When I speak very fast, then I pause. Then you reflect on what I have said. Now, if you are Martin Luther King and you say, I have a dream tonight. Now, I have pulled you up. Uh, uh, to, to, to my, so I've dragged my voice and you are now listening to that dream, to that dream. So there are different ways of, uh, of using your voice, of using your pitch and so on to create attention. If you notice, for instance, people are sleeping when you're uh, doing your speech, you raise a tone. If you notice they are sleeping now, after you raise your tone, it means you are monotone, you lower it or you, you go quiet, and once you go quiet, uh, then people now wake up again. So why is there silence? So you've drawn uh, their attention. So sounds, um, even groaning sounds. Um, if, 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 if some people are listening to you and they start, and they, you, see, you hear people saying, and they're shaking their heads, how do you interpret that? Or they are doing this and, uh, and there's no, oh, oh no. Or they are saying yes, they are saying yeah. 
go for it. Now, you have to interpret all that depending uh, on the context and the culture. Kinesic basically means body movements. I've just moved my hands, my facial expressions. If I'm very serious, there will be a crease here. Uh, and if I'm laughing, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be bright and, uh, and my face will be lighting. Uh, those facial expressions, if I do that, if I do that, uh, all that, the posture, if I start speaking to you and I'm leaning like this, I'm saying, you guys, so that posture speaks something. If I lean forward, I'm drawing attention. I'm saying I am attentive. If you're speaking to me and I'm folding my hands, I'm saying I'm close. So I'm not, and if I turn like this or I do like this, or like and all those things, you interpret them and you say, what kind of uh, communication am I eliciting? What kind of feelings am I eliciting in that person? There are numerous things you can do with your hands to drive home a point. The problem is that if you're not aware, then you will keep to one symbol, to one symbol all the time. And if you keep to one symbol, people can even start counting. One, two. Um, if you do that, and that's the only thing you do, then again, people will start counting. But if you mix those symbols, you're driving a point home, you drive it. You can say, you cannot say, praise the Lord. You say, praise the Lord. Because then then your, your voice and your, and your words and your volume and your hands enhance uh, what you're trying to say. An optical is the amount of light and color. How are you dressed? Are you dressed in a bright way? Are you, are you in a dark, dressed in a dull way? Um, are you in a room that is, is, is dull? Is a, fu is a function in a very dark place? Does it require light? So light and color, uh, and, and these days of Zoom and, um, and evening meetings that people have, um, these things become very important. What kind of light do you put at the pulpit? Um, that and, and, the, and the amount of light you have can enhance a certain mood. Uh, so sometimes you can achieve certain uh, objectives by adding or reducing uh, the amount of light. Tactile. Tactile is a sense of touch and the sense of feeling. This is extremely important uh, among friends, uh, and particularly in a family, uh, in a way, in a marriage situation, among buddies and, and friends. Um, I don't know whether you have watched recently uh, uh, something between Trump and the president of France. Uh, if you watch Al Jazeera, once I want to check Al Jazeera or some other, uh, some other uh, international media, when they want to make fun of uh, of, of the way he uses his body. They say because he's big, he uses his body to draw people in. Um, so like with the president of, of France, uh, he, will, he will hug him, he will touch him, he will at one point, one of the pictures is he's trying to remove something uh, in, on the president's, uh, some, on, on the jacket. And, and they say that he used, and then, and then the president of France, who is a little more slender than Trump, somehow uh, uh, reciprocates. So he also touches him uh, and so on. It shows uh, uh, comradeship. It shows uh, that you have broken the ice between the two of you. And of course, in a marriage situation, it's very, very helpful. Um, you can remove a lot of stress uh, from your spouse by just uh, touching them uh, and, and so on. And children, it works wonders with children, particularly younger children. Um, when you hug them, when you lift them, if they are very small, you kneel, you come to their level, or you lift them up and you bring them to your eyes. Uh, it just makes them feel good uh, and their emotions um, uh, become uh, warmer. Space, special, is utilization of uh, space. Space, um, th there, are, there are different things you can say about space. You can talk about public space. Public space uh, in, say, an American setting would be anywhere from uh, 3.6 or 3.5 meters away from you. 
That is public space. Then you come to social space. Social space is like one and a half meters. One and a half meters. And then personal space is about uh, uh, three quarters of a meter. Now that's personal space. Then you go to intimate space. So if we go upwards, we, you begin with intimate space. You go to personal space. You go to social space. You go to public space. Now, you have to select how you communicate these spaces appropriately, depending on your level of uh, uh, account. Uh, your level. How do you? How much do you know that person? Senior people, for instance, need to be given space. Uh, you can't intrude into their personal space. And even you and me, if we met and we don't know each other very well, there is a space beyond which I shouldn't go. I should never intrude into your personal space unless I am your spouse. If I'm your spouse, I can intrude into your personal space. Now, of course, this, this now, and then there is the intimate space. Of course, during these days of COVID, these spaces are being observed uh, fairly well. But you want to be sure that you are not inappropriate in breaking uh, into people's um, personal space. One day I went uh, to some, some place out of this country. I was a young student, university student, uh, this very highly spiritual type um, that obviously uh, have nothing to do with sisters uh, at, at, at that time. And uh, you greet them with a, uh, with a pole. But this, uh, this was a, um, a, a, a South American uh, uh, girl. I was in a conference and we had spent some time together. We were students and then she was leaving. Then um, she was saying bye to people. So she came and before I knew it, she had hugged me. And I said, I said what has just happened? I've never been hugged by, by someone of the opposite sex. I was a zoo chairman. How can, now I'm looking around to see who else has seen this. My space has just been, uh, my personal space has just been uh, uh, broken. And I was very, now for her, that's normal in their culture. Uh, that's how you express your uh, compassion. And she has nothing beyond that. She is not intending to be intimate. That's just how, <laughs> by the time I came back to Kenya, I had many sins to repent uh, because I had been hugged by a sister. Uh, so anyway, that is something about space. In an office setting, you also have your space. And uh, these offices that, um, particularly these people who, who have big offices, very senior people, so the door is far, almost a kilometer away. So you enter, you, you are trying to knock, and you can't even be heard. Or you were you heard, you were told to come in, then you walked and the person is far. Between you and that person, by the time you reach there, if you are the shy uh, type, you may have collapsed. So it communicates something, it communicates authority uh, and power. The bigger office you have, the more powerful you have, the higher you are in, an, in, a, in, a, in a building, the more important you are, and, and, and all that. Uh, temporal, temporal is time. Time. People say time is money. Here in Africa, uh, we are not very keen on, on, on time, but time is a symbol of communication. In Europe and other places, if it is 10, it is 10. Uh, on the dot. And I'm glad even this meeting, we started exactly at 7.30. We communicated that it is important. And the pastor did not want to waste your time. Um, you, you canceled some things. You came to this Zoom meeting and it takes 10 minutes to start. Uh, the people dishonor you uh, and so on. That's all I'll say about time. And then olfactory is taste, sense of taste and sense of smell. That's why people have deodorants. Uh, and that's why people want to smell good. Uh, and so on, and because that's a symbol of communication. Uh, you don't want to go to a social place and people are running away from you, or you are sensitive about what you are uh, feeling and, and what people think uh, about you. And that reminds me a long time ago, um, when I was again uh, a student, uh, I got an infection of uh, fungal, fungal infection on my legs. Uh, brothers, uh, may have a rough idea of what that means. Uh, when your shoes are smelly, you can't remove your socks uh, in places. Uh, you go to places where they are removing shoes uh, because there is a carpet, and you just don't know what to do. Uh, it's, it can be, it can really torment you. So it's a way of communication. 
um, and you want to endear yourself to the people um, and, and so on. So I realize that our time is, uh, is, is, is much gone. And uh, um, I think that actually was the major slide that I was, uh, I, I was going to discuss. Um, and I would say, let's work hard to see how we can apply these things in our own context. Competence means that you will be able to interpret, to look at, to select, and you are better when you utilize as many of these uh, as possible. And there's one place, for instance, that is utilized, um, like in the, in the Holy Communion in a local church. In the Holy Communion, there is a uh, speech. There is something written about the, the Bible is read. Uh, is there something about numbers? Uh, there might be uh, there might be bread and wine. So those are two. Um, uh, pictorial, maybe there's something that demonstrates what they are. Objects, the sacraments themselves. Those are objects. Those are artifacts. Uh, somebody will will speak. There will be movements as ashes are serving and so on. Um, there, of course, there will be light. Um, uh, the, the feeling, uh, the, the, the question of touch, if there is a prayer and people's hands, people are laid hands, uh, except now during uh, uh, COVID. Uh, space utilization uh, and how far are you if you're serving uh, the other person. Um, time, is, it's a particular time of factory, the taste of the, of the bread and the taste of the wine and, and so on. Uh, and something like that which utilizes all these symbols is memorable. In a wedding ceremony, you will find lots of these things. The more they are, the more memorable uh, that uh, those, those communication uh, occasions uh, are remembered for a long time. All right, uh, Pastor, I think I, I stop there and then we can hear reactions and questions. Um, even things, I, there may have been some things you may have wanted me to cover and I didn't cover. We can cover them during the uh, question time. That thank was you, thank you. Fast though. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Wangombe, for uh, taking us through that. Um, maybe my first question would be, and um, I'm glad, so if you have any question, feel free to utilize our chat, or you can raise your hand, I will be able to see it. And I can see Dr. Joshua Mwangagi is, uh, is still with us. You had indicated that he would say something. I know he yeah. had informed me that his uh, network was not very good. But let okay. me try to un unmute, ask him to unmute, and yes. then we can um, um, hear from him uh, before we get to the questions. So feel free yeah. to uh, write your question um, on, on our chat or request that I unmute you. Um, Dr. Mwangagi, um, please go ahead and mute yourself. Um, yeah, let me ask him my question because we don't have much time. Yes. Let me ask him my question, then he can unmute and answer it. So, Dr. Tari, um, you, were, um, you were a salesperson for many years. Uh, Dr. Mwangangi is a vet, uh, but he went into marketing. And uh, I think he has uh, quite some experience uh, in that area, including um, advice that he could give uh, to us, just, just in a brief uh, statement or two. Dr. Mwangangi. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you are hearing me. Yes. Um, what you have learned today, though it is uh, very intense, start within a very short period of time. Oh, sorry. We. Is it me or uh, is it uh, him? No, I think we are losing him. All right. He had actually indicated to me that his network was not very stable. What I would stable. say is that suddenly wired in communication, it's not as easy as it seems because each one of these points is very, very My journey, when I started this journey, my biggest challenge was attention. How to get attention? Okay. Sorry, Dr. Mongagi, I think there are issues. 
So, Dr. Aro, uh, Pastor Aro, you can you can go on. Okay, okay, no, no, no problem, no problem. But um, I think one of the things that uh, Dr. Mwagagi was saying is that uh, one of the major issues he faced was getting attention, which you mentioned as a hurdle that, that people have to go through. Um, my first question is, is it possible to overdo communication, that you, um, your zeal and your ambition to effectively communicate leads you to overdo it and maybe create even more hurdles? Is, is, is there anything like that? <laughs> Uh, th th there are two statements uh, I can make there. One of the statements uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Smith uh, used to tell us in his book, uh, Creating Understanding, first of all, is that you can never not communicate. You can never not communicate. Because even in your silence, you are still communicating. And now you are asking whether you can over uh, co communicate. I doubt that you, well, I don't know of a situation where people have over communicated, um, but the, the, the participants can, can comment. But I know that uh, marketers uh, have said that you need to say something seven times uh, in order for something to stick. So if you haven't said it seven times, it's unlikely that you have uh, over communicated. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. that You cannot overdo that communication. Um, we are living in times um, where social media has really taken um, the, the, the forefront, uh, especially amongst our young people and, and all these. And you have said that when it comes to sables and all these, uh, most of them are contextual to catch us. But you find there are very many sables, uh, because I believe communication is communication. The emojis, there are pictures that people will send and all these. Um, I, I hope I'm not throwing you to the deep end. But when, when it comes to these sables and these signs, should we be careful in terms of using them? Or if I know I'm using this sable to mean whatever I want to mean, um, can I just use it and not be concerned about whatever anybody interprets it? I know what I meant, so that is their business. <laughs> uh, very interesting question. Um, when we were defining communication, we said that you have not communicated until what you wanted to be understood is understood the way you intended it. Mm -hmm. So it is my role to ensure that I am not misinterpreted by my listener and my reader. So I want to be as clear as I can so that I do not confuse the person who is uh, listening to me or watching me. So when I come to all these other symbols, uh, emojis and so on, I have to ask myself, who am I writing to? Do they, and is that, is that their language? I, I think for young people, um, a lot of that is their language. In fact, for me, the danger is choosing the wrong, uh, the wrong one. So once in a while I was trying, uh, I, was, I was trying to respond to someone using emojis and I had to ask my daughter, how do you, which emoji should I use <laughs> to mean this? So otherwise, I am not going to use them because I might use them if I don't, if I haven't understood them, I might be saying something completely out of, uh, out of the ordinary and then they will be laughing at me. So in fact, what I've learned these days, when I go to speak to young people, I do not attempt uh, their language unless I'm extremely clear because they look at me and I, uh, and I am awkward. They think I'm an awkward old man trying to, to say things I should not be saying. So I expect them to understand me the way I am. If I am going to use their language, and I should try to use their language because that's the way you reach them, but I am going to rehearse, I am going to understand, I am going to pretest that with my own children so that when I go, I don't make a fool of myself. And I might even ask them to debrief me when we come back. Ask them, did I use those symbols uh, correctly? So it's very important to choose very carefully. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, well answered. 
Um, I think um, Dr. Mwangangi uh, is back. Let's, um, uh, Dr. Mwangangi, please unmute yourself and uh, feel free to uh, proceed. Sorry for the delay. I was going to comment on profile picture. I, I think no, Dr. Mogari's network is not very good. <laughs> yes. Yes. You wanted to sorry. comment on profile pictures. I, I wish I wish we had that. Yes. I wish we had that. Because Dr. Mogagi, we, we didn't hear you for quite a bit of what you said. Um, I think your network is breaking. Yes. Wow. Now we can hear you. Now you can hear me. Yes. I was talking about profile picture mm -hmm. in our social media to indicate who we are as a form of communication. Thank you. All right. Wow. Yes. 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 Yeah. You're saying that uh, you, 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 yeah, you, you are photograph on on your social media sites really communicates who you are, and, and and I think that's a very strong point when it comes to social media, in that we can communicate certain things that um, uh, we may not intend. Actually, sometimes even accepting or rejecting a, 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 a social media request from someone that you don't know depends on uh, what they have on their social media. I can see Leverett Richard Wanabuko asking, what is the difference between information and communication? Because I think most of the time we are being informed, whether it's in preaching, than being communicated to. Dr. Wangonde. Yeah, information is mainly one way, one way communication. So you, you, pile the information, you pile the information, you are not wondering whether you are being heard on the other side and whether you are pe the people are asleep or whether they are responding or not. Communication on the other hand is two way and communication seeks to create understanding. And if you really want to communicate, you want to read the faces of the people. You want to see whether they are responding. You want to involve them by occasionally asking a question and seeing whether they are responding. Even saying praise the Lord and asking them to say amen is also a way of feedback. So there is a big difference. Uh, you may inform a lot and think you have communicated or not to be surprised when uh, you leave and people cannot remember what you said at all because you, you were just doing one way. So uh, preachers, speakers, parents must always ask themselves whether they are communicating or informing because there's a big difference. Thank you, thank you very much. And now you have mentioned the issue of amen. And uh, there was a question in my inbox about amen. And uh, the question was, what is Dr. Angobe's comment on those who demand I think the key idea is demand <laughs> a big amen from those co the congregation when ministering. So you people are not saying amen and you are pushing them and forcing them. <laughs> and uh, he also would like to hear your comment on the use of interpreters in ministry. Sometimes the speaker moves very fast. The interpreter is not able to move with them. What is your comment on this too? <laughs> The issue of amens is, is quite interesting and, and almost controversial. There is something good about amens, but there is something bad about those amens. The, what is good about amens, in, in fact, for me, I would rather have an amen coming before I have asked, because it means I am with the people and whatever I have said has sunk. Once I start whipping them, to say many amens, I'm actually not with them. I'm now forcing them. And I am confusing, uh, they, are, they are saying many amens in response to my, uh, to, my, to my authority. I'm confusing that with a blessing. In, in other words, I'm whipping them up and their emotions. So 
I would, uh, I do not rule a man's out, but once they are more than three in a sermon, three to five, anything more than that is, is being overdone. Um, two or three, I would, I, I can live with that. <laughs> uh, I, I do, I, I will throw in an amen or two in my sermons, but they will not be more than uh, a certain number. Because once they become more than a certain number, then you are now almost, you know, being carnal. Uh, I, I don't want to say that too much because uh, I, it's a controversial area and uh, uh, every preacher has their own method. So I, I, I am only saying because I, asked, I was asked that question, I think that if they become too many, they, you become, they become mechanical. Now you are corroborating people. It would be nice if there's one or two people are sleeping, you, or there's a point that has really blessed you, and there's a natural praise of the Lord, and you say, can God's people say amen? But if you overdo it, now you are going beyond uh, uh, your boundaries. Oh, there was thank you, thank you. What was the other question? I can see somebody saying they are guilty. <laughs> they are as guilty as I'm sorry, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other question was about using, of, using interpreters and, uh, and, and maybe the speaker is moving even faster than the interpreter. Yeah. Um, every time there is a, a, trans, a translation, it's actually a translator. Um, every time there is a translator, know that there will be a small loss of uh, the content, there will be a small loss. Um, you may not avoid a translator in some places if you do not know the language very well or you're not very conversant with the language. So you might need a, an interpreter. But once you get an interpreter, then, or a translator, then remember you are co-preachers. Uh, I still remember one, 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 of, uh, one, one bishop who was having a, a, uh, somebody interpreting for them and, and uh, then he was so fast. And then, then in the middle of the preaching, he turned around and told uh, the interpreter, Piga Magotti. Uh, now he, he wanted to pray uh, for the interpreter to get the spirit of, uh, <laughs> of interpretation. And this is a fellow pastor. Uh, in fact, at that point, he actually told him, uh, you can't come to interpret for me without a tie. Uh, and yet he's the one who actually called him to come. So really at that point, you are embarrassing the person who is interpreting for you. If you want an interpreter, respect them. In fact, I would prefer have a sitting, like five minutes minimum to hang out, you know. So in fact, one, whenever I have had a, uh, somebody translate for me, I give them my notes. We actually sit and say, so I'm preaching from John chapter uh, 3, uh, verse 16, and uh, the, my, I will have three points. This is how I intend to go, uh, so that they think and they pray also, uh, and they have the message. If you have uh, the luxury of time, give them the whole manuscript, or have a chat with them, even if it's on phone, brief them, so that they can start thinking about difficult words that could come from that passage, that, and they look for the Kiswahili words. Uh, and so on. I think it's good to then ensure that the person interpreting for you, you respect them as core preachers and don't, and don't embarrass them. If you have something against them, don't say it in public. If they are a disaster, then release them honorably. Uh, tell them, thank you so much, my brother. I can see you really tried, but it looks like we are not um, connecting. I'm too fast. Try to blame yourself in public rather than blaming them. And then is there some other person who, who can go at my pace? And always remember, your goal is communicating, not informing. In fact, your goal is persuading. There's no way you're going to persuade if you are just informing and you're not explaining what you're saying. Thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, my friend Diana, she's asking. Many saints are guilty of saying what they do not mean and not meaning what they say. I'll call you, I'll pray with you, etc. Please comment on that in relation to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, that our yes should be yes and no be no. Also on over promising and under delivering both in the church and professional or business circles. So, so I, I think it's a, they, they are, there are two things there. One is saying what they don't mean and um, 
they don't do what they promise and the other one yes is not keeping their promises and failing to deliver uh, yeah. it could be in church it could be in the professional world or business circles yeah one of the reasons why people get tempted to to say things they will not do is that they are uncomfortable with silence so they are trying to fill in the silence by saying things to keep the keep people talking so so you are parting and they say all these things many things that they will they will actually not do when i realize that uh, that can happen for me now when i'm re replying uh, I do not say, I, I try to say, uh, I, I try to avoid to say, uh, I'll pray for you. What, unless I know I will actually do, what I do, I change that statement a little and make it a prayer at that time. I say, I am praying. Like even I'm replying a, a resp uh, an email, instead of saying, I will pray with you, I say, I pray that God does this, this, this. Then I'm not guilty of postponing uh, prayer. Um, and uh, if, if I will truly pray, then um, I will write a note and say, I prayed for you this morning. Um, and if I, am, if I am now, there are too many people and people are saying, well, please pray with me on this and this and this. Right there, I will say, may God do this. Or I say, receive it in the name of Jesus. Rather than promise, and you know you will not deliver. But I think it's a habit we need to reflect on. Uh, because it's so natural, it's so natural to, to want to feel, to look good at, by, by people you have preached to. So they want to know that you're going to pray with them, uh, for them, and immediately you leave there, you, you, you forget. I think overpromising is, is, is not good. It, it, you know what it does? It hurts your credibility. Your credibility. When people get to know, you, you, you don't pray. They may not know, but then your relationship with God uh, will suffer at some point because you are you are lying, uh, you are not telling the truth. So I would actually say, without making anybody feel very guilty, I'll, I'll I'll just say, reflect on what you say, how you relate with your audience, how much can you achieve? Try to achieve as much as you can during that event, and don't uh, carry too much because as soon as you go home or you leave where you are, you will find other things that are that will occupy. Uh, your, your time. Um, yes, I, I know our time is, is gone, but uh, just a few things. They, they also saw the issue of, of a promise, especially when yes. it comes to business, or even yes. sometimes when it comes to, uh, uh, to church, but in business circles, where you promise and you don't keep the promise. Um, yes. How do you handle that? Yeah, let me comment on that. It's, it's one of the most embarrassing thing. And uh, working with Christians, fellow Christians, and I'm not uh, pretending here that uh, that I am very good at this, but but I find it's it's very bad when um, you are talking with someone, you have agreed what they will do, they don't do, and they do not say. And uh, I lead a small staff team, and I see it all the time. Um, you know, we agreed we'll do this and this and this. Somebody doesn't do it. They don't say they didn't do it. You discover it long, long time after deadlines have passed. Um, this over promising and not delivering happens a lot in business. Somebody says, come at this time. You go, they have not started. They, they were supposed to clean the car or mend or, or mend, repair a bed or, or give you, do a stool. I still remember how frustrated I was when we were our first baby and we, we were looking for this baby cot. Um, we went, we paid uh, half. Kumbe, by the time, uh, and then we sort of come, come tomorrow. So I come tomorrow, I, I know the, the kind of court that I have left there. I come, it's not there. There's another one that is, that is, that is halfway done. And then I'm told, uh, yeah, we are just about uh, to complete, give us a little more time. Kumbe, they actually finished and sold uh, with my deposits. Uh, now, and that happened like three times. Business people who are Christians, must not just try to be excellent in what they do in terms of work, but also be excellent in terms of what they promise because it hurts your credibility. You better say upfront, I, I, will, I will not be able to do this. Uh, I have looked at the costs. I find that it's a little difficult. Uh, it is going to be hard for me to do this so that I make up my mind quite early. All I tell you, I will do it. It will cost this. 
so that again you make up your mind i will need so if i say i want to come for it tomorrow don't tell me come if you know you have another five jobs tell me uh please no tomorrow might be difficult can we work with that day uh and and now if you're a serious christian businessman you note what you have promised so that when wednesday comes and it is wednesday evening and you have not even started it's your business to take your phone call that person and say please don't come tomorrow morning i was delayed uh, can you add me another day that way you are a man and a woman of integrity if you can't keep those it hurts you and it hurts you, your relationships very badly and it's the same thing with if you're borrowing money and you need to pay you promise you'll pay at this time you 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 did not pay and i'm not saying that you will always have the money i have suffered myself like that but it is my duty to say to call ahead of time and say brother i had expected some money from this place it's delayed uh please can you add me another and you're not calling me that morning you're calling me a week before or three days before uh, the money didn't come i am afraid can you add me another week or several days that way then i know where i had planned to take the money i'm not taking because it's not there it's a big subject <laughs> we can't complete it yeah thank you thank you very much um let's just take a, another one maybe five minutes and then and then we close uh, because i've seen a question from Reverend richard and this question just reminded me something you sing on vambo can Dr. Ngombe comment a bit about the importance of the tone of the voice, the unnecessary repetitions and giving unnecessary information. And uh, I remembered the other day, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll cut clips from my sermons and, and send out. And this sister replied to me and asked me, why are you shouting? You know, I've, I've sent her a message. I think it's very important. I think the message will touch her. And the, the response is not, I'm blessed, I'm touched. It is, why are you shouting? So in terms of the tone, and, and maybe you can comment even in the context of the family, to children, to spouses, is, is, it, is it this important? <laughs> First of all, on, your, on, your, on, on, on the letter, on the small note you wrote, I think this person uh, was already convicted, and now you were adding souls to injury. So it's like uh, <laughs> somebody has a wound, and you're treating them with salt. You are adding salt. So they were saying, I already have a heart. Please don't, don't add, I'm going to, to die. You know, don't add. So um, I, I would say that um, like now, when we are doing Zoom and we are doing uh, YouTube, I have had to look at my summons constantly and edit them. There's a difference between verbal summon and, and a written one and a video one. People who are watching you are not going to, uh, to love repetitions. It's just like if someone is, is giving news and they keep repeating uh, on television, keep repeating, you get bored. So, so I, you edit them for, for I, I, these days, I even know the number of words my someone would take. And I, I know that for a thousand words, I need 10 minutes uh, to speak. So if I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes, um, I, I know approximately how many words I want in my someone. So over repetition in a sermon hurts the listener. They are not going to listen too much. The tone, uh, on, on issues of tone, and, and on that, especially if you're preaching, there are th certain things that irritate if you keep on repeating them. You keep on saying, say amen, hallelujah, uh, as I said. Uh, and then the, most of us preachers, myself included, we also um, are victims of, uh, of, of saying, um, two more minutes, uh, three more minutes, I'll finish uh, uh, as I conclude. And then we do it seven times. Uh, and, and someone has, uh, has spiritualized and said, you are not a good preacher if you have not said you are concluding seven times. Uh, but now if you do that, uh, the expectation that you had created on the other person that you are finishing, that expectation is not met. And there's, oh no. And maybe they, they want to go particularly these urban, urbanites, urban uh, members of the church who, who are watching the time. And there's no place they are going, but, but you said you are finishing at this time, so you finish and let us take tea outside there without being bothered by another and uh, a long sermon. So that's important. Now, tone. Tone is very important. Actually, very important. Um, if you're talking to a child, 
the the way you speak to a child depending on their age and whether they are you know they are attuned to children and and there are children other children who, who obey so uh john uh please take this split uh, to the kitchen uh that is different than saying some john take this plate to the now you are bang and i'm avoiding to bang so that uh, you you you, <laughs> you hear drums are not now when I start doing that, now I have communicated anger, I've communicated other things, anger. If we have not quarreled with this child before, that child will go thinking, there is something my father doesn't, I, I have made him angry, there's something else, there must be some other things that I don't know. So that child will go thinking, why? What have I done? Now if they are teenagers, hey, they will just think, they will just say, I, I don't want to talk to my father. They will start avoiding avoiding you now so tone is important but you see you could have told him take that plate to the kitchen then they didn't do it say it john i said you take that place plate to the kitchen they didn't do it now even them they expect the tone to rise a little because now you're getting angry and you have a reason because there is a history but if you if you are always screaming, shouting, your spouse, uh, you know, especially for spouses, you know, your spouse knows you pretty well. So they know even as you enter the gate there, uh, how you look and the way you're talking, they actually know uh, your mood. So if you come and raise, when you raise your voice, they know. And since now, this is not, time, not the time you, you were, uh, well, now is a box while in gear. So <laughs> they, are, <laughs> they are up in their house. So you're not going to intimidate them. So, so <laughs> they as may also raise, or they may give you the cold shoulder. So so you have raised your tone and they go quiet. So these these things are very important. Of course, when you're quoting the I love you and the I love you. The I love you, don't you know? You know that there's a big difference there so the tone and that's why even in music when people are doing music is a way there's a clear crescendos there they are, you you move the emotions to a certain level you you calm down and and, and so on so the voice of your tone is extremely uh, important I, I know we didn't cover the whole of it but just touching thank you thank you thank you uh, and i think that is important thank you very much george wafula is saying quite beneficial much thanks, Leverett Wangombe, for sharing. Uh, thanks, Leverett Wangombe, for hosting. Blessings to you all. Thank you. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Our time is far much spent. We are 12 minutes past time. So, and it would be important for us to close it at that. I, I want to believe that these, these are important um, uh, um, and inspiring messages that help us in everything that we do. We need to communicate and communicate effectively. So thank you very much, Leverett Wangombe, for availing yourself and allowing yourself to be used of the Lord to minister to us. Um, I always like uh, giving uh, Leverett uh, Kangede an opportunity um, to say hi and pray for us. When you have uh, 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 some of these senior people together with us, it's such a blessing. So uh, Reverend David Kangede, he has been a guest on this forum and he's always together with us. I pray for us but you can say hi before you pray. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Waroi. Always a pressure re uh, listening to Dr. Uh, I'm quite inspired and also challenged. Uh, I'll have to be a bit more careful and well organized when delivering my summons. And I've learned quite a lot from uh, the presentations and the discussions. Uh, I think we take, we take communication for granted in many ways. Uh, but I think listening to him, uh, we have many, many areas to improve on uh, and also many, many ideas that I have picked from uh, this discussion and the previous one, uh, which I believe uh, will help us even as we move forward. Uh, just allow me, Waroe, uh, Reverend Waroe, once again, to just thank you for, for these webinars and these discussions, uh, shining the light. I, I think it's so useful to all of us. We are learning different things and uh, 
I know it takes uh, uh, quite a bit of effort even to source for resource persons for us. Uh, so again, I don't take that for granted. The fact that you have a guest for us on a weekly basis, I, I think I, I want to commend you for that. And to appreciate again all the, the, the participants and the listeners uh, who have joined us today, because without all of us, then it can't be what it is. Uh, so let's pray together as we trust God for the evening. Our loving Father and our God in the name of Jesus Christ, we just want to appreciate you, Lord, and to bless your holy name for who you are and God, what you are doing in our lives, O oh Jehovah. We want to thank you, Lord, for the Shining the Light mentorship uh, session that we have just had, O oh God. Uh, many of us take uh, communication for granted. But mighty Redeemer, through the learnings that we are doing here, we are going to perfect our skills. Uh, we are going to improve in our communication. We are going to improve in our messaging uh, and even in our public speaking, Lord, uh, and particularly those of us that you have called uh, it to be co-workers with you in the area of ministry, oh God. We thank you for a resource such as Dr. Wangombe, who has uh, uh, basically uh, Help us this evening, oh God, as your word says, uh, that iron sharpens iron, Lord. We count ourselves blessed that this evening, mighty God, you have used him to sharpen our skills in communication. May you continue to uplift him, even to strengthen him, Lord, uh, so that he can continue adding value to the lives of the people that he interacts with. Thank you for Reverend Waroi and uh, this session, Lord, that he has been organizing for us. Uh, we want to pray for grace upon him, oh God, and even favor, Lord. Lord, so that when he approaches even other speakers, Lord, who are going to come here and speak to us, mighty Father, he can have favor with them and also favor with you, O God. Thank you for all the listeners and the participants tonight, including those who have asked questions that have added value to these discussions, O God. May you help each one of them, O Jehovah. And may you continue to bless us, O oh God, and even to help us shine in the various areas where you have put us. We want to thank you and we want to bless you for this evening, Lord, as you disperse us with your grace. Uh, continue blessing us even the rest of the week as we look forward to the uh, uh, weekend, Lord, and to our services that are uh, ahead of us. O oh God, we just want to give you praise, glory, and honor for what you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. And Father, we do this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Bernard is saying that uh, he requests for season three. <laughs> thank you very much. And um, I'm grateful for each and every one of you for uh, joining us tonight. I'll be sending out the invitation for next week, just tying a few things, and I'll let you know what we'll be looking at next week. God bless you. Have a good night and Kwaheri for now. <laughs>